So as the past couple of videos have shown, I really enjoy stories of destroyers going up against the odds. I think that just speaks to the fact that people like underdog stories. And the story of USS Johnston certainly embodies that. Johnston was a Fletcher-class destroyer that came into service in late 1943 and have a very active, albeit short, career. I think Commander Ernest E. Evans of Johnston summed up very well what his ship was going to do the day it was commissioned. This is going to be a fighting ship. I intend to go into harm's way, and anyone who doesn't want to go along had better get off right now. It certainly would prove to be true when Johnston would participate in the Battle of Samar the following year. Johnston would displace 2,100 tons standard displacement and 2,700 tons full load. She would be powered by four boilers that drove two shafts, producing around 60,000 shaft horsepower, giving her a top speed of 35.1 knots. She would be armed with five single 5-inch or 127mm 38 caliber dual-purpose guns, with two super-firing forward, another two super-firing aft, and one forward of the super-firing rear turrets. She would also have two quintuple torpedo tubes in the middle of the ship. She would also carry five twin 40mm and seven single 20mm anti-aircraft guns. She would also carry an armament of depth charges. She would be laid down in May of 1942, launched in March of 1943, and commissioned in October of that year. Johnson left Seattle on November 11th and operated in the area until the 15th, where she then headed to San Diego to conduct armaments training and evaluations, and going along the west coast until mid-January 1944, where she made her way to Hawaii. Her first major campaign would come later that month, when she would assist in the Gilbert Marshall Islands campaign. She would initially screen for a force of cruisers and battleships, where they would provide naval bombardment support for American troops fighting on the atoll. This continued until February 25th, where she was reassigned to escort transport ships to the Elise Islands, along with several other destroyers, but on the way she was recalled to the Marshall Islands, where she would conduct anti-submarine patrols and continuing to screen and providing gunfire support for American troops. Johnson was relieved from her patrol duties by several escort carriers, where she would stick around in the area until the 7th of March to head to Espiritu Santo and arrived on March 13th. They would stick around in the area doing minor repairs to prepare for the upcoming Solomon's Island campaign arriving in Purvis Bay near Guadalcanal on the 20th of March. Being assigned to patrol duties in the area, the following week she and some of her sister ships would be dispatched to provide bombardment support in the Caroline Islands. Johnston would return to the Solomons, where and for the rest of March and April she would patrol the area and escort Allied convoys, as well as some minor storm bombardment work. In early May, Johnston would head to New Georgia to provide a screen for cruisers and mine-laying operations in the area. In the next couple of days, Johnson would help to sink a Japanese submarine with depth charges, sinking it just after midnight on the 17th of May. After this chase, Johnson would resume normal screening duties and anti-submarine patrols until late May where she would head for minor repairs. On June 2nd, when Johnson was completed with repairs, she was with a convoy of U.S. cruisers and other escorts that were going to join a fleet that was going to recapture the U.S. territory of Guam. Arriving by the 18th when the invasion was delayed due to the Battle of Saipan that was going on at the time, on the 30th, the fleet was ordered to return to the Port of Origin. Following some time, their invasion was set to begin on the 14th of July. Johnston, like the previous cancelled invasion, was to sail as part of the screen for the invasion force. The force arrived on the 18th, where Johnston would screen as well as participate in bombardment duties, firing 3,546 rounds of her main battery in this period of shore bombardment support. On August 9th, Johnston screened for a force that was leaving the area and returning to the Marshall Islands, and then on to Espiritu Santo for repairs. After some more moving around, by the 4th of September, Johnston was setting sail to screen for the invasion force of Peleliu, helping to screen for escort carriers doing so until the 18th, where she was then ordered to Utilai in the Caroline Islands. Johnston would next be assisting in the invasion of the Philippines, as part of the escort for Taffy 3. On October 25th, after about a month after departing from Utilai. Now... It's going to be a pretty complicated battle I'm going to try to cover here, so you're going to have to bear with me. The battle I'm going to attempt to cover here is the Battle of Samar, where it pitted Taffy 3 against the forces of Takeo Kurita. Now, Taffy 3 had six escort carriers, three destroyers, and four destroyer escorts, against Kurita's four battleships, six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 11 destroyers. The battleship force also included the Yamato with her 18-inch guns. The Japanese hoped in their attack that they could stop the invasion of the Philippines with the sortie of the combined fleet. Anyway, actually getting back to the action, with Johnson at about 6.50 in the morning, she received an alert that Taffy 3 was being pursued by, quote, a large portion of the Japanese fleet. General quarters were ordered in all hands to battle stations. At this time, the Japanese force was about 34,000 yards away. Commander Evans ordered Johnson to produce smoke and make a zigzag pattern. At 7.10 in the morning, Johnson opened fire on the nearest Japanese cruiser with her main battery, 
prompting a response from Japanese cruisers and battleships. Now, due to the volume of the fire, it prompted Evans to order his ship to stand by for a torpedo attack, starboard. Now, to ensure that his torpedoes would be in range and effective, Evans closed his ship within 10,000 yards before he fired his torpedo salvo. Johnston, as she continued to fire with her main battery, would have at least two confirmed hits spotted on the leading Japanese cruiser, Kumano, heavily damaging the ship and forcing her from the fight. After emerging from the smokescreen, Johnston found herself in the line of fire of the Yamato's secondaries and main battery, along with the light cruiser Nishiro. This combined fire made Johnston disappear from the view of the Japanese spotters. At 7.30, those shells from Yamato hit aft, knocking out the after fire room and engine room and all power to the 5-inch mounts in the rear, along with severely damaging other parts of the ship and killing some of the crew. Following this, Johnston somehow managed to get into a rain squall and received 10 minutes of rest to evaluate the damage. After temporarily fixing the radar, they were just in time to assist in firing at a cruiser at 11,000 yards. At 8 a.m., Rear Admiral Sprague, the leader of Taffy 3, ordered the destroyers and destroyer escorts to attack with torpedoes. Although firing all of her torpedoes, Johnston fell in line with the others to provide fire support. After providing exemplary covering fire, Johnston and the rest of the destroyers and destroyer escorts were ordered back to the carrier formation to attack the cruisers that were assaulting the carrier force. Johnston, at this point, was in pretty poor shape. She was limping along at 17 knots, and after nearly avoiding a collision with the Hearman, Johnston was heading southwestward and practically surrounded by Japanese battleships and cruisers to her port quarter and Japanese destroyers to her starboard quarter, at ranges from 7 to 12,000 yards, using her smoke to cloak her position. At 8.30, Johnston attempted to draw fire away from an escort carrier, but was unsuccessful. Then at 8.40, Johnston changed targets to a group of destroyers, closing in on other escort carriers, setting a course for the Yahagi, a light cruiser who was leading the attack. Johnston closed to 7,000 yards and began scoring hits. Johnston tried to cross the T of the second destroyer of the group, but the other Japanese ships turned and began to open fire on Johnston. But Johnston was then ordered to turn and open fire on Japanese cruisers who were still attacking the escort carriers. As Johnston steamed away, she was hit several times. Johnston, by 9.20, was in worse shape than before and still afloat somehow. But this wasn't to be for long, as Japanese cruisers were in effective firing range of her. And at 9.45, the order was given to abandon ship. At 9.55, all the men who were capable of doing so left the ship. The ship sank shortly after. Of the 327 men on board, she suffered 50 killed in action and 45 who died of wounds or exposure later on. The remaining crew were mostly rescued by October the 27th. Now, the Japanese would lose the overall battle of Leyte Gulf, in part due to the heroic actions of Taffy 3 and USS Johnson in particular. It's truly hard to fathom the bravery and courage it takes to bring your 2,800-ton ship up against an overwhelming force like that of Kirita's. USS Johnston and her actions are simply put awe-inspiring and truly an amazing tale. Thanks again for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe.